Thank you so much, Julia. Thanks for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for attending this. It's a real pleasure to be able to connect with uh, folks across the pond and elsewhere. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this very distinguished set of uh, scholars that you've been able to put together. So uh, I've been enjoying some of the uh, talks and uh, look forward to those that are still um, in the future ahead on this particular series. So today what I'm going to talk about is uh, people analytics, uh, understanding and enabling the future of work on Earth and in space. Um, I'm going to try to monitor the chat. I'm not sure I will be able to, but uh, uh, feel free to post something and I'll try, I'll try my best. But I, right now I can't even see my chat uh, window, so I'm not sure where it is. So, But feel free to interrupt in any case if you have questions. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure that many of you haven't heard the word people analytics. So uh, let me first start by talking a little bit about the history of how that work, how that word came to be. Um, and it started out mostly in this century, a few years ago, where this article by Forbes talked about the fact that the geeks have arrived in HR, uh, human resources, people analytics is here. And the funny thing is it says the old fashioned fuddy duddy HR department is changing. The geeks have arrived. Basically, it means that all of a sudden, HR is no longer that old-fashioned uh, approach. Um, it's now taken over by uh, a new generation of data scientists. Uh, along that same time, there was an article that appeared also uh, saying how Google is using people analytics to completely reinvent HR. In fact, the people who were in the HR group the, in people analytics at Google, they would carry this uh, sticker on the back of their laptops, which I'll let you read it. And it basically says that all of a sudden they realized that they could make a much more data science approach to studying, uh, studying um, people analytics, et cetera. Uh, the New York Times Magazine had the story which said what Google learned from its quest to build the perfect team. New research reveals surprising truths about why some groups thrive and others falter. Uh, in particular, what they found was they spent two years studying about 180 teams, the most successful shared five different attributes. Those five attributes were to start with psychological safety, which meant that if the team members felt psychologically safe, they were much more likely to uh, uh, be successful as a team. And then there were other characteristics. One thing I'll note here, two things I'll note here. One is notice that uh, intelligence or skill or uh, talent was not on this list. That's in other words, it was not that teams that were more talented were more likely to be successful. One can make the argument that that's because uh, everyone at Google is smart, and so there was not much variability on that. So you had to look for other things. It might not be the case in other places. The second point I want to make here is that all of these qualities that they came up with were individual level attributes of the of the team members as a way of predicting it, et cetera. Uh, there was another article that came out in McKinsey where they said power to the new people analytics also around the same time. And then they continued and there was another article in Deloitte that also talked about recalculating the route of 27 global human trends. But the Deloitte report also pointed out something interesting. It pointed out that 9%, only 9% of, uh, the human, of uh, companies believe that they have a good understanding of which talents are driving performance. Likewise, they found that if you look at it, the uh, if you look at the um, uh, the report by the Data Consulting Service, they also found that uh, that even though there was a lot of interest in people analytics, that if you looked actually at the amount of money that people were investing, big data investments going to a, uh, to HR, it was less than five, uh, less than five percent. So what we are beginning to see here is a situation where people are interested, intrigued by what people analytics can do. But a large, very few companies think that they've really gotten any good insights from people analytics and that therefore they're not spending much money and investing as much money in uh, HR as they're investing in big data investments in other areas, for example. So uh, in response to this, my colleague, uh, uh, Paul Leonardi, who's a faculty member at UCSB and I, we published an article in Harvard Business Review titled Better People Analytics Measure what people, uh, not measure pe who people know, not just what, uh, who they are, et cetera. And so we, uh, we published this article and the main point of this article was to say that most people who were doing traditional people analytics were only focusing on the individual traits and uh, just like the study that I was telling you about psychological safety, et cetera. They were focusing on just individuals rather than also looking in addition to the attributes of the individuals, looking at the relationships they have. So this is where the networks come into it. We say relation analytics, meaning focusing on individuals, network data, teams, network data, and organizations, network data. 
So what we were proposing then as a result of this is something as an analogous to looking at uh, MRIs. If you look at the brain, you're able to see by looking at these uh, pictures, what is the difference between a stable brain or a, a, of, a, of, a, of a normal human being on the left and what you see as a different pattern if you look at it, somebody who has schizophrenia, et cetera. Except that while this is looking at things from a microscopic point of view, when you look at networks, sometimes you have to look at it from a macroscopic point of view. If you look at this, this is a picture that doesn't make a lot of sense if you look at it at this particular, if you microscopically zoom in to it. But as you begin to zoom out, you begin to see a picture. And this is, of course, Henri Matisse's uh, famous painting. But what your point, what we are, the point here being that the more you come out of something, you're beginning to see certain kinds of signatures that you want to do that. Now, of course, how do you look at these signatures? How do you get at these signatures in terms of networks, et cetera? For the longest time, people had been restricted by only looking at network signatures in terms of, um, of, of individual survey data that we were collecting on networks. But today, of course, that has changed. And that now, if you look at enterprise social media, there are digital platforms that allow us to communicate and, and therefore also keep a trace of all those communications, whether it is uh, Workplace by Facebook, Microsoft Teams, Slack, Jive, um, and Zoom, for example, et cetera. And so what you begin to see is that there's a lot of activity that is happening across all of these. And the question is, what if you could leverage this digital trace data in order to better understand the networks within the organizations? So if you look at the large number of, uh, uh, of these platforms and it's even growing further, Gartner had a report that was released before the COVID, which said that they expect that this kind of collaboration platforms is going to go up to a 4.8 billion by 2023. Um, I reckon that because of what has happened as a result of the pandemic, that uh, growth has actually accelerated even further. As we know, we're just looking at the profitability reports that Zoom announced within the past week um, of, their, of their sudden increase in use and demand across the world. So again, because of this, we have a lot of activity network data that we can get by what people do in terms of messaging people, sending documents, giving thumbs up, badging people, sending emails, and so on and so forth. And this then allows us to look at this from that macroscopic point of view and begin to look for what these structural signatures are that are going to help us identify what is happening in the organization. In the article in the Harvard Business Review, we touch upon six of these signatures, nothing novel here. This is based on decades of social networks research. But if you start with the top left one, what we call the ideation signature is the signature that says, if you see a person who has a network signature that looks something like this, where they're connected to people who are not connected to each other, we know from social network research that they are much more likely to come up with new ideas. Um, if you look at this signature here, we call that the influence signature, which says, that if you have a node that is connected to other nodes that are in turn connected to other nodes and so on and so forth, those are the people who are more likely to be influential. This of course we know as, an, as a variation on the eigenvector centrality measure in networks. Um, <clears throat> these two are at the individual level. If we now go to the teams, you see an efficiency uh, signature, which said that if team members who are in purple out here have a lot of connections amongst themselves, they are much more likely to get their work done efficiently, not necessarily creatively, but efficiently. On the other hand, if you want to see whether a team would get it be creative and innovative, you need to look at the signature in the bottom left corner here, which basically says that teams that have connections to people on the outside who are not connected to each other, mainly, namely they have non-overlapping external connections, those are the teams who are more likely to be innovative. The next two and the last two out here focus at the organizational level. And this basically allows you to see to what extent is the network in this organization siloed. So to what extent is it within departments? In network terms, we know that is the modularity index that allows us to see how much of the connections happen within groups rather than between groups. And then finally on the outside, we have the vulnerability signature. To what extent is the network being manipulated by someone on the outside who's connecting to many people inside who are not connected to each other? So, just by taking these individual signatures, we've had this for a long time. Our argument is that until recently, we've not been able to make this actionable in organizations, largely because collecting survey data is painstaking, it gets obsolete and so on and so forth. So what uh, this presentation today is going to focus on 
is if we are able to take these relational analytics, how can we make them actionable at the organizational level and at the team level? I'll first give you three use cases at the organizational level, which I will not be going into more detail because I will focus more on, on the next slide, introducing relational analytics that are actionable at the team level. At the organizational level, we all know there's a lot of emphasis today in the area of diversity and uh, inclusion, et cetera. And we, I make the case that organization that network data allows us to go beyond diversity. We have lots of diversity metrics today that allow us to see in terms of demographics, in terms of various other kinds of individual attributes, to what extent our workplace, for example, is diverse. But what it is, has a much tougher time getting at is inclusivity. And what do I mean by that? Inclusivity means that it's not just important to have people who are going to be at the table, so to speak, or in the group, but to what extent are they actually engaging with the group? To what extent are they being listened to? And to what extent can they contribute, et cetera? And so network allows, network analytics and relational analytics allow us to see not just where the nodes are and what diversity is in the nodes, but to what extent are each of these nodes being able to contribute? To what extent are people reciprocating ties to them, et cetera? And so there's a larger ability for relational analytics to tell us about not just how diverse our communities are, but how inclusive are they in terms of engaging with a lot of different ideas, et cetera. The second is in the area of succession planning. To what extent could networks allow us to prepare and see who should come in next? When we talk about succession planning today, we look at the attributes of the individuals. That is who a person is, what qualities they have, what skill sets they have. What we don't look at, at least not in a systematic way, is what are the network connections they bring? What are the assets they bring in terms of their relational connections to other people? And succession planning can gain a lot by allowing us to evaluate potential successes, not only in terms of the individual attributes, but also in terms of their portfolio of relational ties that they might bring. And then finally, post-merger integration. It's well established that mergers and acquisitions have a very checkered uh, 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 success rate. Um, the vast majority of them don't succeed very well. And clearly network analysis and relational analytics has the ability to take large organizations to look at the networks that they exist in before the merger or the acquisition, and then to begin to identify who are the key individuals in each of the original organizations that are well positioned to help create buy-in, to help create the kinds of connections that would make it a healthy transition as a result of the merger or the acquisition, et cetera. As I mentioned, I'm not gonna talk about actual research in these areas, but I see a lot of promise. And so I wanted to make sure that we touched on it briefly. What I'm gonna talk about today is focusing on relation and analytics and making them actionable at the team level. And by that, I mean, how can we use relation analytics to help us, for example, assemble teams in a more effective fashion, if not assemble teams by ourselves to make others allow us to staff teams in a more um, effective manner? To what extent can we use relational analytics to predict team performance? And then finally, to what extent can we use relational analytics to predict team conflict? So let's uh, say why we not, well, as I mentioned already, you know, why we're not leveraging network insights in the enterprise? That's because surveys tend to be, that are, that are used in the past uh, are time consuming, they elicit lower response rates, and they are rapidly obsolete. So what if, we could have survey data at minimal cost with 100% response rate and updated 24 seven. Well, that's exactly what we're able to do if we are able to find a way to try to take this digital trace data and use it to predict what people would have said on a survey. And that is in fact, uh, the first example of what I'm gonna do. So before we get into these examples of how to make it actionable, we wanna see how well we can predict what people would say on a survey. So this is a collaboration with some colleagues at Santa Barbara, as well as Fudan University School of Management in, um, in Shanghai, uh, that, that we've been, that's been ongoing um, and turns out, fortunately in some ways, we started this before the COVID crisis. So we actually have network data, both survey network data and digital trace data before the COVID crisis and then uh, thanks to some two grants from the National Science Foundation, we continue to collect that data during and post and hopefully post COVID as well. So the example I'm gonna give you here was data we collected from 66 employees at a Chinese company that uses an enterprise social media platform, which uh, looks very similar to some of the things that, we've, that we would see in this country, except that it's in, uh, in, in the West, except that this is all in Chinese, et cetera. And the goal was to take digital trace data, as you can see from back in April 
and May of 2019 and see how well it would predict what people would say on a survey uh, about their relationships with one another. And so what we found was we asked questions in the survey, such as the traditional questions that we ask in a, in a network survey in organizations, you know, does this person provide me with a sense of purpose? Who do you rely on for leadership? Who do you go to for help or advice at work, et cetera? And then our goal was to see to what extent could we predict what people would, who people would go for advice just by taking all the digital trace data. So we use a, a network modeling technique called the exponential random graph models, where we are estimating the joint probability of distribution of network ties and using instead what we have as the digital trace data as sort of quote unquote, the independent variables in this, in this process, et cetera. So in terms of modeling it, we take an example, we, uh, as we do the uh, exponential random graph models, we also get some substantive insights about who someone is likely to say provides them with a sense of purpose. So if you look at this example, it says that employees who send someone one message per day are 15.2% more likely to say that, that person provides them with a sense of purpose than those who do not. Likewise, we find that employees who send someone 10% more messages than they receive from that same person are 26.7% times more likely to say that that person provides them with a sense of purpose compared to a pair of people with an even split. So what you see is that just by looking at metadata, who is sending messages to whom? Who is sending more messages to whom? Other examples would be who, how quickly someone replies to a message he sends them. That all of these things provide clues about who people are more likely to trust, who they see as a sense of purpose, who they see as providing leadership. So as we began to look at this, we got really excited to see what kinds of data we could get. So this is an example of results from the exponential random graph model. And as you can see, there's a lot of different uh, 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 variables that all seem to have significant effects. I'm not going to go into great detail on these, et cetera. But suffice it to say that this approach has a lot of promise to help us understand how we could use digital trace metadata to be able to predict what people would have said in a survey without burdening them to actually conduct a survey and making sure that this metadata, which can then get updated on a daily basis, can give us essentially 24-7 current survey data, um, or at least predictions of what people would say on a survey, et cetera. We are, in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, repeat this, but we tried this for a variety of different uh, uh, network questions. This one, the previous one was who gives you a sense of purpose? This is who do you rely on for leadership? Yo, once again, we get some really interesting findings. We repeated the same thing for advice seeking. And essentially what we found was that once we had estimated this model, for which we now also had some substantive interpretation, we were now able to take this statistical model that we had developed and now move it into the prediction realm. So as we look at it, we could take the model that we estimated, and then as you can see from this confusion matrix, as well as from the precision recall plot, that we can begin to predict how many people would have said uh, sense of purpose about other people, et cetera. Um, the, uh, the accuracy is very high, but that is because the majority of people, majority of the ties were not were predicted to be null. And so, of course, uh, accuracy is a little misleading in those cases. And that's why we give you the precision recall based upon a threshold of 0.1. But as you look on the, on the right-hand side, you see that there is uh, uh, the proportion of predicted ties that actually exist or the proportion of existing ties predicted by a model uh, vary along that uh, PR plot that you see on the right-hand side there, et cetera. And as you look at it, you begin to see that, again, this is at the very starting stages. We've only begun to do this in the last couple of years but we already see a lot of promise in terms of being able to take these digital trace data and be able to make predictions of what people would say on a survey. And as you can see that the red lines out here are what are the, the plots by uh, based on the models that we estimated in exponential random graph models. And on the, on the blue is what you'd expect by random blue line. Now, for those who may not be as familiar with this, ideally we want this red line to cover all of this area. So the area under the curve is an, is an index of how good our models are doing. So ideally we would want it to go all the way to the right. If you can see my, uh, my um, pointer and then all the way down. So this is doing quite well. It's certainly doing much better than random, but there is obviously room for improvement. So on the basis of this, we've come up with different kinds of dashboards that we have developed. Uh, one that is called a relational analytic dashboard, where people essentially will see the same signatures that I showed you on the Harvard 
uh, business review case. But at the back end, it's taking digital trace data using the exponential random graph model to predict what people would say on a survey. And then on the front end, we are able to then uh, go further and be able to make uh, predictions on the basis of that. So uh, I, that's, this is, I'm just going to, uh, I'm not gonna go into the model that you, you can see that website there. Uh, if we have time at the end, we might uh, have a chance to look into that. But that website doesn't, it's a free login. You can go in and play with the test case, which actually has data from a real organization that has been completely uh, anonymized for the purposes of this demo, but it's something that you might be interested in, uh, in playing around with, et cetera. So the next set of things that I'm gonna talk about, now that we know that we can predict survey data from, from uh, digital trace data, how can we apply that to different contexts? The first one is self-assembly of teams. A lot of us increasingly today, especially in academia, are forming teams that we self-assemble. We decide who we want to work with on a paper, on a project, uh, on a conference, on a panel, whatever the case may be, we have a lot of autonomy. So the question is, uh, sometimes those teams work out well, we call those dream teams, but very often we also live in what we would call nightmare teams. And so the goal is how can we predict which teams are likely to be dream teams versus nightmare teams and what can we learn about how we go about choosing these teammates? And so what we did was a study that with my former student, um, Marlon, who's now on the faculty at the Animal School USC, uh, Diego Gomez-Zara, who's just finishing his PhD year at Northwestern, uh, my former student, Jackie, who is uh, doing a postdoc at Harvard Business School. And we asked the question, how do self-designing teams assemble? <clears throat> so again, just to clarify, Teams can have be created based on people having agency, that is they themselves are involved in forming the team, or it could be that they don't have, individual members don't have agency, they were randomly assigned, or somebody else staffed them to the team. And most of the time we don't do that with structured information available, but sometimes you might do it with structured information and then we try to uh, use, and so what we are focusing on is this cell here, that is teams where people have agency and self-assembling into these teams, and they have some level of, of structured information that they're using to form the teams here. So the uh, example I'm gonna give you, the study that I'm gonna talk about here is how do people decide who to invite to their team in the modern organizational? What mechanisms uh, explain the invitation process and uh, how do we design these teams? So the data I'm gonna to talk to you about is data that we collected from school teams, class projects that were collected by teams that were working across two universities uh, some of them majors were environmental ecology majors, some of them were social psychology majors from two universities, and each team was required to have members from both universities. The goal of the project was to simulate an advertising campaign to mitigate an environmental sustainability issue, which is why you have people from environmental ecology who know about the environmental sustainable issues and people from social psychology who can come up with good social science based influence campaigns, etc. So participants assembled into teams over the course of one week and they used a technology platform. We had two, we collected this data twice. The first time it was 213 participants who assembled into 32 teams. And then the second time it is 197 participants who assembled into 31 teams. The platform that we used is called My Dream Team and was developed here by my lab here at Northwestern. And basically what it is, is very similar to what you might think about in terms of match.com or any of these other approaches, which basically says that you have uh, people, um, you know, in, in the case of match.com, you go in and put in some information about yourself and then you can go search for other people that you want to go date. We took that same idea of creating a, a platform, but rather than having it as a dating platform, we said, how about if you set it up so that it is uh, a platform for you to be able to find teammates rather than romantic partners. And so people were began to answer, respond to personal survey questions on the, uh, uh, as you see on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, they said, you know, who do you want to work with? Do you want to work with people who are your friends, those who you've not worked with before, those who are friends with many people? You can choose how important each of these criteria are. You can also see how many on your team do you want to have that particular criteria. Then you get a list of recommendations, which you see on the left-hand side out here. And then you can learn more about those people. It tells you how, what criteria matched it. It says Brian was a, cho a choice because you said you were interested in people who were good at presentation, finance, and sports. Uh, you could send an invitation. You could invite them. You could learn more about them by clicking on the le learn more button out here. And then when you send the invitation, they would get an email that said, oh, so-and-so has sent you an invitation. And those people could go and look at it, et cetera, and then decide whether they want to accept that invitation. 
So what we wanted to do here was to say uh, who was recommended to whom and look at the recommendations and then see who invited whom during that period of time. So the network that we were looking at was the network of invitations, who invited whom, and we were trying to make predictions about that. Our hypothesis were that if somebody was recommended by the technology, then it would make sense that that person would be invited. Uh, we also expect that if someone had previously worked with someone, that they are more likely to invite it because prior collaboration and familiarity has been long established back several years as important uh, criteria why you predict someone, largely because it reduces uncertainty and you know that the devil you know is better than the devil you don't, and so you're more likely to uh, rely on that person. The third hypothesis was to what extent would we be more or less likely to invite someone if we are familiar with them from the past, that is we have familiarity or prior collaboration, and they show up on the recommendation list as a, as a top recommendation, et cetera. We also kept as controls other things we know makes a difference, obviously skills, competence, as well as homophily, people tend to go for others who are the similar birds of a feather. So we use those as controls, but our hypotheses focus on the two that we, uh, on the two variables and the interaction between them that I just mentioned. What did we find? We found that for the, the two hypotheses were supported in both the samples. Remember, we collected data in two separate years. And in both cases, we found that if a recipient showed up on the top 10 recommendation, that they were indeed more likely to be invited, which basically says that they have some faith in our recommendations and they listen to the recommendations and that's good to know. The second one also not surprising, it reinforces what we've known from the past. If you have previously collaborated with someone, you're more likely to invite them. The interesting thing was the third hypothesis. And the third hypothesis, remember, this was about whether I would invite someone, more or less likely to invite somebody if I have previously also worked with them and they show up on the recommendation list, et cetera. And what we find was a negative interaction here, which basically shows you that if you look at the uh, in a recommendation ranking, if they were not in the top 10, then if you did not previously collaborate with them, you're not likely to invite them. If you did previously collaborate with them, even if they were not in the top 10, you are more likely to collaborate with them. But if you are looking at them on the top 10, what you see is that if someone shows up on the top 10 and you did not previously collaborate with them, you're much more likely, this line is much steeper than this one, you're much more likely to now begin to invite them. On the other hand, if somebody is a, one, is a recommendation on the top 10 is someone that you have previously collaborated with, you are, you are more likely to, but not quite as much as if they were not a collaboration. So basically what it's pointing out is that technology recommendations are more influential in, in getting you to invite people you don't previously know and are less influential when it comes to people you do know because now you already have inside information on your own and you're not necessarily relying so much on the technology to be able to make those recommendations. The same, the same interaction effect was found also in the second sample, so it's a fairly robust finding. I'm going to move now to the second use case, and that is not if you're assembling teams on your own, but what if you're trying to staff a team? That is, you are not a member of the team, but you're trying to put a team together to do that. And of course, this is motivated by a lot of the work that we do in a variety of different contexts, including the military, including space, where people who, are, who look at my research and self-assembly say, well, that's all fine and dandy if you're looking at academics who want to self-assemble in the teams. But when we are in the army or when we are trying to send somebody back to the moon and Mars, there is no room for self-assembly. There are those teams are gonna get staffed. And so with that in mind, I'm gonna to talk to you next about some of the work that we are doing. Again, this is with the PhD student here at Northwestern, Brennan Antone, uh, <clears throat> who is in industrial engineering and management science, uh, Alina Lungianu, who is a colleague of mine here at Northwestern, as well as Suzanne Bell, uh, who is at NASA and Leslie DeChurch, who's another colleague of mine here, and you've already seen Jackie Young, who is a postdoc at HBS. So we began this work a few years ago, and it's to looking at it, how to use relational analytics for predicting effective space crews. We all know that humans are about to become an interplanetary species, and that by 2033 or thereabouts, many uh, commercial as well as agencies like NASA and the Chinese and European space agencies are hoping that we are going to be setting up a habitat on, on, on Mars. The journey to Mars starts with the Artemis mission, which is hoping to put the, next, the first woman and the next man uh, back on the moon uh, in the next three to four years, and then on from there uh, to go on to Mars. Uh, 
there are some interesting dis uh, distinctions that we should think about here. The International Space Station is 250 miles above the Earth. The moon is 250,000 miles from Earth. That's a thousand times farther. And Mars is even a thousand times farther than the moon. It's 250 million times miles away from the Earth. So what, what this means is we are talking about something that is really far away from us, and the amount of time it's going to take for that mission is going to be approximately a year to get to Mars. And then you have to stay on Mars for about a year till the orbital dynamics are such that, move the, uh, that the move Earth and Mars got close enough so that you can quickly sling back from one to the other. That's one of the reasons why you noticed that recently there was a whole spate of uh, missions that arrived at Mars. And you may remember that there were a whole spate of mission that, missions that left for Mars in the middle of last year, because those were the small windows during which you would leave so that you can make a quick journey to, uh, as you see in this picture out here, from Earth to Mars, et cetera. So what it also means is that as you get closer and closer to Mars, time it takes for the speed, what they call light speed, is it's gonna take up to 21 to 22 minutes for an audio signal from Earth to get to Mars. And what that basically means is that there is no way to continue with that legendary phrase, Houston, we had a problem, because by the time you know about the problem and get back to them, it's gonna be 45 minutes. So that means that these crews have to live with much greater levels of autonomy than what we are seeing here on Earth. So how do we try to think about taking teams that will have to be caged in together for a three-year mission with no voluntary exit. You've got maybe four to six people, most likely different nationalities, because it'll be an international mission. Uh, and you're putting them together in a small space and hoping that they're going to survive over this long period of time. Well, putting people into hazardous situations is not entirely new. Uh, William Shack, Ernest Shackington, uh, wrote about this a long time ago. Men wanted, this is when he was trying to get teams to go to Antarctica. He said this was a classified ad that said, men wanted for hazardous journeys, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in the case of success. And of course, what kinds of people wanted to go? These were people who basically were found to be people who were low on self-reflection, low on emotional expressiveness, Basically, what we found is that the Antarctic station became a haven for the technically competent individuals who were deficient in social skills. These are people who didn't want to do anything here on, um, you know, didn't have much of a life and said, what the hell, I might as well go to Antarctica. Today, that's not the same. On the space station, this is a diary entry by one of the astronauts uh, that was put together by Jack Stuster, who is a space scientist. And this diary entry by an astronaut says, so-and-so, his commander, is a master of good-natured fun. He's brilliant at knowing the perfect balance of fun with professionalism, et cetera, which basically tells us that today space has to be a place for the interpersonally gifted people. In fact, uh, what we want to do is understand what are the qualities that will make somebody be a good teammate in space. And if you think about it, when, uh, when um, Scott Kelly came back from the International Space Station, one of the first things he said upon his return back to Earth is that teamwork makes the dream work at NASA. So how do we go about doing research on what happens to teamwork under extended periods of isolation and confinement? So you can ask yourself a scenario where you have a team, you're trying to figure out who the US person would be on this team, and you know information about the others, their education, nationality, gender, personality, and collectivism, and so on, personal skills, et cetera. So wouldn't it be nice to have a human petri dish where we are able to uh, collect data about people by looking at them, by putting them into a, you know, into a small chamber, in an isolated chamber for hundreds of days at a time while we make them do complex and boring tasks and monitor them 24-7 physiologically, psychologically. Um, and of course, you're looking like no institutional review board in their right mind is ever going to allow this. Um, this is going to be a nightmare for everyone to do this, but actually, that's exactly what we are doing. And we're doing this because a lot of agencies around the world have created facilities like the NASA's HERA Space Analog. HERA stands for Human Exploration Research Analog. What you see on the right-hand side here is in fact an isolated confined cabin where, which is located at the Johnson Space Center and where they put people in there for 45 days at a time right now. Uh, and uh, we are able to study them. It's a very narrow, small, confined space that you see on the left-hand side here and they simulate them into going into missions 
going to Mars or going to an asteroid over the course, and they put them into not only isolation, but they put them into sleep deprivation halfway through the mission. They create the communication delays that also simulate that they will not be able to talk to mission control, which is actually right outside this chamber here. But they simulate all these conditions, and then we give them a lot of activities to do, and we see how well they perform on these activities. We also ask them a whole lot of network questions, who they get along with, et cetera, to see how well the teams are both in, are being satisfied and effective. And before we feel guilty that NASA is the only one that uh, subjects people to this kind of horrific uh, life, uh, it's not true. The Chinese have a facility that's very similar that they euphemistically call the Lunar Palace. Um, the Russians have a facility where we actually collect data. It's called uh, the NEK facility. And uh, in this particular facility, they collaborate, the Russian Space Agency collaborates with NASA. And so we have collected data in this NEK facility where they put people in there for 120 days. And we're getting ready to collect data where they're putting them in there later this year for 240 days. So uh, there are some really uh, high duty simulation that they're doing for these kinds of missions. The Japanese have their own version of it called uh, the Japanese Space Agency JAXA has what they call an isolation chamber. The Europeans have uh, facilities at Concordia, in Sardinia, at, and so on and so forth, in the Canary Islands. And of course, there are also private foundations that are in this. Now to the research. We asked them a question which said, uh, this is actual network data, where we asked them over uh, periodically over the course, in this case of a 30-day mission, with whom do you work effectively? And the green lines on the top show that generally the good news for them is that they seem to work effectively with one another over the course of the entire 30-day mission. If you look below at the hindrance type, who makes tasks difficult to complete, here we see a slightly different story. There is one person at the bottom that very quickly emerges as someone that everyone else thinks is a hindrance, and yet this person seems clueless about it. They don't realize that other people are thinking of them as a hindrance, and in, by and large, they don't think of other people as a hindrance. And so the question is, could we have predicted who would have become seen as a hindrance on this particular mission? Well, in order to do that, we first had to build a theoretical model of all the different factors that could affect social relations between crew members, which in turn could affect crew performance. The schema, the roadmap is what I show on the right-hand side top right there. We start with a conceptual model. We collect data up, uh, through observations in HERA. We then estimate the data using statistical and computational modeling techniques. We then validate and see how well our models are doing with, with sort of training and testing. Uh, and then finally, I'll show you how we apply this to actually not only predict what's going to happen in a particular team in terms of the relationship, but actually find a way to prescribe techniques that would mitigate against potential problems that were found in the team. So we built an agent-based model using a platform called NetLogo that is developed right here at Northwestern by my colleague Uri Walensky and his team. And uh, we took all the variables that we had talked about on the previous slide. We measured on those variables people in the HERA. As I said, we really got a lot of data from those four crew members. And of course, we've collected this now uh, about a dozen times because every year they have four of these missions. And we've been collecting data now for three of those missions. And we are now on the fourth mission. So we got, we'll, we'll have about 20 of these teams, uh, high resolution data, and also the Russian facility that I mentioned where we have data from 120 day mission and now uh, getting ready for a 240-day mission. So we in the difference here is that unlike a lot of people who do agent-based modeling where they use parameters that they come up with on their own based on theoretical guidance, et cetera, here we actually used behavior search techniques, uh, genetic algorithms to parameterize the model by using actual data. So we were using estimations uh, techniques from actual data to be able to uh, identify what the parameter values were for each of these. And then that allowed us to do virtual experimentation. So this is an example of how we were able to do this for different types of ties, positive ties, negative ties, informational ties, behavioral ties. And we were able to estimate as good as we could using, as I said, behavior search techniques to be able to identify how important each variable was. Well, how important was each variable? we get loads and loads of results that look something like this. Now, all I'll say is that if you look at this, we would find, uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples, self-monitoring, motivation, and receiver. What we find is that this, uh, the word that is missing here is positive ties, our positive affect, and then you see hindrance is the second column out here. 
What we find here by looking at these coefficients is that crew members tend to enjoy working with individuals who are high in self-monitoring, and these individuals are less likely to be viewed as making tasks difficult to compute. So the hindrance coefficient is negative, while the task affect positive coefficient is positive. Likewise, in situations where people are having high workload, you see that they are high workload schedules make crew members less likely to enjoy working with others. So just to give you a couple of examples of all the different variables that we were able to do. And the nice thing is that all of these parameters were estimated using actual empirical data that we collected within the model. How well did we do in these situations? If you look at the average performance in the training data, we see that with whom do you enjoy working, our accuracy was 0.766. The F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall was 0.846. And so again, we see that we are doing quite well at predicting who you enjoy working with. Um, if you look at who do you, uh, and then we applied that to the test data and we continue to do that. What do I mean by test data? We built a model based on data we collected from one 30 day mission. And then we tried to predict what would happen on the second 30 day mission. We then took the data from the first and the second mission, re-estimated the models and tried to predict what happened in the third mission. So that's how we were constantly improving our model predictions over a period of time. When we talk, went to who makes tasks difficult to complete, there, we didn't do as well as we did on the positive side. And as you may recall, if you remember on the side where we, in the network pictures that I showed you, everyone in general, a lot of people would say they enjoyed working with other people. On the other hand, hindrance was much, a much sparser matrix. There were fewer people. So the good news from their point of view is that people were not finding one another a hindrance. The bad news from my point of view as a modeling point of view is we just did not have enough data on hindrance ties to give us enough clues and therefore our predictions on hindrance ties are not as good as our prediction on positive affect ties. So again, just to give you an example of how we were able to use this. Now, I didn't get a chance to, uh, to talk about this, but in uh, what we also did, I, I, we may have some slides later on. So let me hold off on that in the interest of time. Let me talk very quickly about predicting team performance. This has nothing to do with space. We come back to earth and we come back to uh, sports teams. So this is work I did that was published in Nature Human Behavior a couple of years ago with uh, a former postdoc now, um, here at uh, Northwestern, Satya Mukherjee, uh, Yun Huang, who is now at Fudan University, Jia, uh, who is at uh, University of uh, Technology in Vienna, uh, and uh, Brian Utsi, my colleague here at uh, Northwestern. What we wanted to do was to study to what extent could we predict which team would beat another team in a sporting event. Satyam is a great fan of cricket. And so he approached me and he said, you know, I want to be able to see if I can predict which team will beat the other team. And I think that we can look at it and make the prediction not only based on the individual stats of the players, but also look at it in terms of the relationships amongst them. And his illustrative example was taking two teams. So the Indian Premier League is, <clears throat> is like uh, in the UK and, and elsewhere where you have people on these uh, teams that are from different countries and so on and so forth. So the Kolkata uh, Knight Riders is one of those teams that is based in Kolkata in, in the east of India. And they had two players who play for India and the rest were all-star players from Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand. The Chennai Super Kings, which is in South India, had six players in the team who played for India, just one team. And they didn't have as many all-stars as the Kolkata team. And yet, if you look at the results, the Kolkata team that had all these all-stars didn't make it very much to the playoffs and were only champions twice. While if you look at the Chennai team on the right-hand side, it was a team that was all, every single year with uh, made it to the playoffs, were runners-up and champions. So why is it that a team that had the all-star team, all the star players from all over the world was not doing as well as the team that didn't have these uh, never was all-star? So we essentially took the data that we had from cricket from these teams. And then we also, uh, collected data from the NBA because we, we found some results in the cricket that we thought was interesting. And so we decided to extend that to the National Basketball Association. We looked at it in terms of the English Premier League, um, the uh, Major League Baseball, and also an online game called Dota 2, which is a computer-based game where two teams are playing against each other in an online environment. And basically what the idea was that what we found was we looked at the attributes to the nodes. So the individual statistics of these players, their individual stats, but we also looked at the extent to which these players might have played with one another, either on that team or on some other team. So it could be two Indian players who are now on the uh, Chennai uh, team together, but they also previously played 
uh, on the Indian national team together, for example. And so we basically took those network ties and we began to ask the question, to what extent are teams where people have played with each other in the past successfully, to what extent those teams are going to be more or less uh, likely to beat a team where the players might have individual stats that are fantastic, but are not have not played with each other previously. And so there are different ways in which we measured statistics on each of these teams, et cetera, and we compared it. The average stats on each of these things for team one versus team two, and then also the network statistics between team one and team two. And basically what we found was that in every single case, the network effects were much more powerful in helping us understand whether which team was more or less likely to win. And we were doing it with a certain level of uh, percentage of games that were predicted correctly that was quite high. And so here again, we see we can use relation analytics to see which team would do better than the other team based not on the individual attributes of the actors, but the relationships that they have with each other. So conclusion, individual brilliance played very modest impact on the outcome of any of these games. Prior relationship in team victories was a much more significant effect on the outcome of the game, et cetera. Um, the last part I'm going to focus on here is predicting team conflict. And in team conflict here, I'm going to again go back into space. So this is work I did with my former postdoc, who is now a faculty member in sociology at um, Indiana University. His name is Michael Schultz. And Michael came to my lab after getting his PhD in sociology at Berkeley, and he was a space buff. So since we already had these space projects, he brought to my attention some work that uh, might help us with understanding shared mental models. So we had a project there. We were looking at the extent to which people's uh, performance might be affected based upon the extent to which they have common mental models of what is happening, et cetera. And we were wanting to see to what extent people should not be mind reading with one another in order to know what they are, what is going on in the other person's mind so that they could be working and being able to work together well, et cetera. We know from the literature and psychology that shared cognition, shared mental models is the single biggest predictor of team performance. And so what uh, Michael took upon himself was to say, you know, right now, almost all of us who look at shared mental models and the studies that were um, reviewed in this meta-analysis uh, were all based on survey data, asking people about what was in their mind and then comparing it to what was in someone else's mind and then using that to build shared mental models. Chances are pretty good that that's a very tedious way of collecting data on this kind of work. And so instead, what he was interested in doing was to say, why could we uh, go beyond this and look to see if we can automate, use relational analytics as a way of being able to compute the extent to which the network of concepts in my head is going to be similar to the network of concepts in your head, et cetera. And in order to do this, what we began to do was look at text analytics as a way of building this connection. So the, just to clarify, the, the links between people here is not how much they talk to each other, but the links here is looking first at the network of concepts in my head, the network of concepts in your head, and the link represents the overlap between these two networks, the extent to which we have similar concepts and similar connections between concepts in each of our heads. And we do that by just looking at our utterances. So text analytics to the, to is, is the, how we come at this, et cetera. The case study that we used is again from space, and it comes from something called Skylab that many of you may not be familiar with. Skylab was uh, the first space station, so to speak. It was a US space station, and it happened between the Apollo missions and the space shuttle. So it was for a short period of time, there were three manned Skylab missions, four in all, the first was not a manned mission. And uh, what we were trying to do was to study, this was back in 1973, we we're trying to study uh, the relationships, the mental models between the crew members that you see on the right-hand side amongst themselves and with ground control or mission control, et cetera, on the, which you see on the left-hand side there. Each of these missions had a commander, a pilot, and a scientist pilot. And the first mission lasted for 28 days and they worked on space. They did three extra vehicular activities. Uh, they had a few technical difficulties, but they were highly involved with mission control. The second mission was as much as 59 days and they did biological experiments. They had also had three extra vehicle activities. And this one did not involve a high level of involvement with mission control back on earth, et cetera. The one we're gonna talk about is the third one. Skylab three, which is the last one. It was the longest one, it was 84 days. It had four extra vehicle activities. They had space sickness, 
initially on the flight, which they hid from the ground. They didn't tell ground control that one of the astronauts got sick as soon as they arrived uh, at, the, at the Skylab station. There was a lot of tension between mission control and crew. And guess what? They actually had what has come to be known as the first mutiny in space. What do I mean? They went, this was a news article which says astronauts went on strike in space to get the weekends off. If you look at the quote in the bottom right, it said the commander of the mission, Jerry Carr, who said, we would never work 16 hours a day for 84 straight days on the ground, and we should not be expected to do it here in space. The, this is an entry in a, a Wikipedia entry called Skylab Mutiny. And in fact, Harvard Business School wrote a case study about this called the strike in space. And uh, some people might argue whether it was a real strike, but basically what, what uh, Skylab did was they said, at one point they said they turned off the radio and refused to talk with the Houston mission control. So you can think of that as taking time out for their own uh, benefit because they needed to calm down. Say. Our goal was, could we have predicted the strike in space? So we did text analytics where we looked at all the data by looking at, uh, you know, these are the conventional measures that are used, but we didn't want to go with conventional measures because no one asked those astronauts about their shared mental models. But we do have all the data transcripts of the air to ground communication onboard voice transcription, about 15,000 pages of spoken communication, 3,800 3, tapes. And we were able to identify by timestamp each speaker and their verbatim utterances. So we were able to get it from the commander, the pilot, um, the scientist pilot, and then mission control has one person who talks to the station. That person is called CAPCOM, which stands for capsule communicator. And so we had, those were the four uh, nodes in the network. <clears throat> we took the text, we did basic uh, LDA text analytics, and we were able to identify for each actor what topics they talked about. And then based on which actor talked about what topics, we were able to build mental models within each actor. This is so. This is the network in each actor's head, and then the shared cognition is the network between actors based upon commonality in their mental models. And then we were able to see to what extent there was a clustering amongst the crew members and the mission control, which is represented in red out here. As you can imagine, there were lots of different types of topics that were identified in the LDA. Uh, some of them you, you'll understand: capsule communication, consumption, EVA, hygiene, uh, solar observation, personal issues like birthday, dad, et cetera, medical issues, and so on and so forth. What we found was that if you looked at the intra-crew similarity, that a similarity amongst the mental models of the crew members itself, that in, it was highest in Skylab 1, it was middle in Skylab 2, it was the lowest in Skylab 3. Not only that, but the similarity between the crew uh, mental models and Capcom also began to shrink down. So clearly there was something about Skylab 3 where they had less similarity between their own mental models and less similarity uh, with the mental model of a capsule communicator or mission control, et cetera. And you can see that on day 15, you were already beginning to see a little bit of how capsule communicator was looking a little different on Skylab 3 as compared to Skylab 1 and Skylab 2, but not by much. But what you notice is that by the time we get to day 35, or then you see there are big differences between Skylab two and Skylab three. Skylab one was not there till day 35, so there's no day 35 date on Skylab one. But if you look at Skylab two to Skylab three, you see there's a big change that you're beginning to see here in this case. Third, this is day 35. The mutiny didn't happen until day 46. What does this tell us? That we can use relation analytics or using text and be looking at these mental models to begin to predict when conflict is likely to happen within these particular contexts, et cetera. So, Again, I'm going to stop there and talk to you about it. I mentioned briefly about the repairing issue. And I'll touch on that again. I'm at the top of the hour anyways. But uh, what, one of the things we did, um, this is quite recently, um, is um, that we took the data uh, that we had about predicting models. So we were able to do a pretty good job of being able to predict who would get along well on these 45-day missions we were doing at the Human Exploration Research Analog. Well, what we did then was we said, okay, we can do a good prediction of what is gonna happen there. Then NASA came back to us and says, you know what? It's great that you told us that A and B, that crew member A and crew member B were not gonna get along on day 25. But what should we do about it? They're already, we know we already put them in there. How do, we, how do we fix the problem? And so that was a new problem that we had to deal with. And uh, in results that we presented just a couple of weeks ago at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, 
uh, what we reported was something quite interesting. We went back to NASA and said, yeah, we want to see whether we can fix it. We have some ideas. One way in which we could fix this is each of these actors has a task, uh, each of the crew members has a task schedule of what they're supposed to do. Sometimes it's solo tasks, sometimes it's work with other people. Uh, so, so in pairs, sometimes a team as a whole, when they have to work on different things. Some of these tasks are very um, interdependent, like jointly trying to monitor uh, driving a rover on the surface of an asteroid, for example, or jointly taking out doing some soil sampling uh, on on a on a on a on a lunar soil, for example. So, in these kinds of highly interdependent tasks, what we said is, tell us what, and they have what they call a, a detailed task schedule of who is going to do what, with whom, on what day, etc. So, we said we think that A and B are not going to get along well. So, they, we have three options: we can either give them a cooling off period where we don't get them to work together, or we get them to work on something they're both very good at because people, when they are good at something together, that helps bond them in their relationships because they're gonna be successful. Or we pair, we ask them to, uh, to couple up with the third person who they both really get along well with because that third person might be able to help them. So given that we had these configurations, we asked NASA if we could tweak the task schedule of who was gonna work with whom. So they said, okay, so one week before the mission started, they gave us the name of the people who were there. We did a survey and got a lot of personality data, et cetera. We used our computational model to predict who was going to get along whom, with whom, or who was more likely not going to get along with whom. Based on those predictions, we designed a study that allowed us to see that if we repaired people, that is instead of having A work with B, if we could have A work with C. So if we repaired who was working with whom, could we use that to repair the relationship, which I thought was a very funny way of taking repairing of people to repair their relationships with one another. And so we, in fact, found that we were able to do that quite successfully. And that really was, so we paired people who we thought were going to do well, we paired people who we thought were not going to do well. And in both cases, we found that those we thought were going to do well got really good at it. And those we thought were going to deteriorate the relationships, in fact, deteriorated the relationships even further. So we did have a controlled sort of experimental design that allowed us to say, not only now can we, we can describe ways in which we can mitigate against these problems. And that to us was some really interesting results. I'm told by a person from Sweden who sent me an email uh, on LinkedIn a few days ago that um, he reached out to me because one of the Swedish newspapers apparently carried a story about this. Um, I haven't seen it because I, I saw my name on that story in the Swedish newspaper, but that uh, newspaper was behind the paywall, so it wouldn't let me go in um, unless I give it a credit card, which I'm afraid I didn't. Um, and so I, apparently someone in Sweden has now gotten interested in this and they reached out to me actually to do a presentation to his uh, association on the basis of this. So I think a lot of what I want to say is that even though these examples are in space, a lot of them can have applications back on them. Since we are collecting this kind of data, um, uh, we are able to do a lot of the things technically, statistically, methodologically. We think that we can take network data in particular and help us make the workplace into a more effective way. So I will hand things over to Julia. Um, as I said, I didn't, for some reason, my chat thing got hidden. So I'm going to also exit so that uh, you'll see each other uh, more clearly and I'm going to stop sharing my screen as well. Thank you very much for your presentation, Ashir. It was very nice. Uh, so please, those who have questions, uh, please raise your hands. Yes, Simona? 